If you can, please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And as you turn there, I'm going to do something called a little introduction that speakers like to do. And this is it. Ready? I'm a millennial, and, which means uh, I'm addicted to nostalgia. <laughs> and also, that means that I was raised in the 1900s. Who here was raised in the 1900s? Isn't that weird to say? 1900s. And I was raised in the turn of the millennium. And may I say, there are some days I really miss 90s family sitcoms, yeah. specifically the family sitcoms. What are the ones that you've watched back in the 90s? Gilmore Girls, let's go. That's like a little bit more 2000s. What else, what other shows? You can out yourself a little bit on like what the things that you watch. I mean, I kind of like watched The Simpsons, didn't know how bad it was, you know. <laughs> Full House, loved Full House. Um, <laughs> Really good, fun ones, right? But there was one show that I really loved, and it was called Family Matters. Family Matters. It follows the Winslow family and one of my favorite side characters ever, Urkel. And if you grew up in the 90s, you maybe understand Family Matters. The, the theme song, I love it. It starts with a piano. And it's great. In this rare condition, this day and age, to read any good news on the newspaper page. Oh, so good. It was just like got me into it. But anyways, this is my expert segue into the title of this teaching, which is Family Matters. Family matters. So by family matters, in this chapter, we're talking about matters of the family of faith. From the account that Paul has here to these Thess Thessalonian believers that he uses a lot of familial language. So we're going to talk about matters of the family of faith. And also by family matters, we're talking about how God's family matters in your spiritual formation, in your sanctification today and in our restoration in the future. So we should note, and if you were to walk away with just any one line, it's this, that the gospel gives way to a new kind of family. That the gospel gives us a radical way of relating to one another that is blood-bought, redemptive, and present and active now in the Church of Christ. So, you ready? Let's pick it up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read verses 1 through 3 together. It says here, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. So, this chapter opens in a really beautiful way that Paul uses this word adelphos to address the Thessalonians. And this word means sibling. We, on our translation, it says brethren, but it's actually kind of cool. It depends on the context. Um, but much like Spanish, if there's a room full of women and there's one guy there, he'll just use brothers. Um, so and it's actually better translated to brothers and sisters. This familial language, brethren, is just actually just like, hey, siblings in Christ. This is such a loving reminder that the gospel that they believed in now made them all brothers and sisters in Christ. And why is this so significant? Why is it so significant that we are called brothers and sisters in Christ, specifically for the Thessalonian believers? Well, they were made up of Jews who were once following the law, right? And they came to believe in Jesus Messiah. This, this church was made up of these Jews, but also made up of Gentiles. We read in the previous chapter, right? They were Gentiles who turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. What a beautiful mixture of families that were once enemies of each other. These two groups were theologically, ideologically, historically, and morally opposed to each other, enemies of one another. But more than that, these two groups, like you and I once were, were enemies of God. Enemies of God. But now reconciled to God and to one another. We read more about this in Ephesians chapter 2, 
verses 13 through 18, and I'm going to read this whole thing because it's so important for the context of family. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, dividing the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law, with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create himself, in himself, I love this, one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access, Jews and Gentiles, to the Father by one spirit. This is the gospel entrusted to Paul to preach that we are reconciled to God and to one another in this family, in Christ's family. So let's continue to read in verse 4. Join me, it says, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing to men, but God who tests our hearts, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, or, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So here's some fun instructions from Paul himself. How to preach the gospel according to Paul. Paul makes it very clear here that he and his companions, when they were with the Thessalonians, they did not use the gospel for their own glory, power, or pleasure. They did not make demands or lord their authority as apostles of Christ and pastors. They could have. They're like, hey, I've seen Jesus. You should listen to me. You know, They could have actually asserted authority there, but they did not. They did not use the gospel for their own glory, power, greed, or pleasure. And what is the application for us today? Well, if we were to think critically here and historically, we've seen patterns in our world where some attempt to hijack the church for their own advancement in this world. I like the word that he, the phrase that he uses, the cloak for covetousness, because it's, it's sneaky, it's a cloak. You don't really realize that the people employing these things and employing the gospel in the church are using it as a cloak for their own gain. So application-wise, what does that mean for us today? Well, for us, we need to be aware or beware of those who promise the kingdom, all the benefits of the kingdom without the king, who promise a utopia, but not Christ. Those who stay for the miracles and wonders of Jesus, but will not eat his flesh or drink his blood. Beware of those who like the culture of Christianity and how trendy and fun it is. They love the culture of Christianity, but they will not carry the cross of Christ. Beware of those who promise such big things, if you give, if you donate, if you endorse their way, if, and, and they say that if you do that, then I will give you all these things that really only Christ himself can give, that only Christ can do for you and his bride. Beware of those who promise spirituality and justice without the Spirit of God. Beware of those who maybe promise power without the authority of Jesus who said, if you desire to be great, drink my cup of suffering. Be a servant. Be the last. You want to be first? Be the last. Beware of those who use this, his church and his gospel as a stepping stool for personal gain, ascent to power and glory, because this is not the way of Jesus. And let God test our hearts in this area, as Paul says, because we can then so easily be like, beware of them, and then demonize them, but instead let us pray for those who seek to do these things, right? Let's pray for those who seek to do these things. Pray what Jesus prayed, where he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And we can even pray such intense prayers towards Paul-like conversions in people who seek to do this. Paul himself, an enemy of the church, thought he was doing God's will, but God met him, stopped him in his tracks, and gave him a new mission to follow the persecuted Christ. 
We can pray prayers of salvation for those who seek to do these things. We don't have to demonize them. Instead, we can know the power of God to transform a life and to change their tracks and their mission to follow the persecuted Christ. So praise the Lord that Paul did not come to the Thessalonians in that way. Praise the Lord, it was, there was no cloak of covetousness. Instead, Paul get, then gives us a different example, an example of Christ-like leadership that is radically resistant to the kind of leadership we see in the world today, the kind of leadership that values greedy power dynamics and vain glory. Paul gives us a different picture of Christ-like leadership. And are you ready? Are you ready to see what it is? I mean, you've already read this chapter, but like, <laughs> pretend, act surprised. Um, verse 7 says, But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. And we continue here. How to preach the gospel according to Paul? He says, like a nursing mother. Oh man, this familial language is so beautiful. It continues as these grown men act like nursing mothers for the sake of the gospel. What a radical concept. What a radical concept that's resistant to even how we understand what leadership, what the world says leadership looks like, that these grown men acting like nursing mothers, as nursing mothers cherishing their own children, they affectionately longed for them, saying, hey, we preach the gospel, but then we also gave our whole lives to you, and because you came, became dear to us, and then they labored day and night to not be a burden. So I have a two-year-old, so this hits really close to home, and if you're not a mother, um, maybe uh, as we look at this picture, consider how you were mothered. But if that's a difficult image for you, then consider how God has nurtured you. Maybe consider like the spiritual mothers in your life who have nurtured you spiritually as we look at this image. But how radical is this? And how honoring to women that this picture of a nursing mother points to the work of the gospel that this picture of a nursing mother points to the work of the gospel. And you've heard it said that to believe in Jesus means to be born again, right? When we're born again in Jesus, when you get saved, you're like a baby. You're like a little baby, right? And if you're new to the family of God today, welcome. You're a little, little spiritual baby, so exciting. And you get to bask in the beauty of the simple gospel. John 3 talks about this, being born again. First Peter 1 talks about this, of what it means to be born again. And then I love this because Paul, in our, in our passage, he likens raising up new believers to the gentleness and self-sacrificial care of a nursing mom. And I don't know if any of you've nursed before, and maybe even just formula feed too, that's great as well. Fed is best, uh, as they say. Um, but when you're feeding a child, you're holding the child close. That them being feed, fed implies closeness, intimacy, vulnerability, nakedness even. Um, this incredible patience that needs to be practiced when you're feeding a child is great. And the task of nurturing and nursing in this way uh, is wonderful because the ingredients are simple. You only really need to give them one thing. And that's milk, right? First Peter 2, 2 alludes to this saying, like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Paul says that this gospel nursing work resulted then in genuine affection towards them. There's a bonding that happens, mothers who've nursed before, a bonding that happens when you're feeding your child. Such a beautiful thing. This image is so vivid to me because we know that Paul spent somewhere between three to six weeks with the Thessalonians. Three to six weeks. You know what else takes six weeks? Postpartum care. <laughs> About six weeks. It's giving postpartum care. And in verse 9, it implies that he continued to work also as a tent maker so that he wouldn't be a financial burden to these believers. Shout out to all the working women here who have full-time jobs and still do the work of the gospel. You are 
walking out what Paul did. He, I don't wanna be a financial burden to the church. I'm gonna work and still do the work of the gospel and pour into people's lives and nurse spiritual babies into maturity. And this is how we are to make disciples of nations. Yes, we preach the gospel, that is so important, but how? Paul here shows us we give our whole lives, like nursing mothers, an affectionate, patient love for those who are growing in the faith. There's gentle care practiced here. Amen, I love that. (laughs) So then Paul continues in verse 10, which says, you are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom in glory. So how did Paul and his company behave themselves among new believers? Well, he says here, as a father does his children. So they behave devoutly, which means that in a way that is holy and set apart. They behaved justly, which means they were upright and they were equitable. They behaved blamelessly, which means there was no cause for disapproval. There's nothing bad you can say about them. And they exhorted, which means that they're already walking in a way. And parakaleo, that word means that they're walking and then they call you to walk with them. And then it says that he, he comforted them which means to soothe and console. I know there were times where I was nursing my son and then I was so sleep deprived and I just hand my son to my my husband who soothed and comforted my son, which was really beautiful. And it also says that he charged them, which means to testify, you were testified of, he taught them, there was a witness to them. And Paul uses this fatherly language pretty often in his letters, right? He sets an example that reminds us today of an intentional and present and comforting father. In other letters, what did he call Timothy? A son in the faith, right? A son in the faith. What a beautiful picture of discipleship in the family of God, that we could be spiritual kids to people who are more mature in the faith, but we could also be spiritual parents for those who are still growing in the faith. That is discipleship in the family of God. And now to the Corinthians, uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 4.15, he says, this is a really interesting passage, and we're gonna camp out on this a little bit. He says, for even if you had 10,000 others teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. I became your father. You could have 10,000 others teach you about Christ. Love that. Interesting. So what is the application for us today when it comes to those who spiritually father us? Well, it's kind of a check engine light for me. Well, this is what the Lord brought up. I can listen to 10,000 preachers and podcasts and read 10,000 books that teach me about Jesus, which are all good things. I can do all those things and still have no intentional discipleship in my life. I can listen to all these awesome things. And yeah, you know, it's an, it is important to be a student of the word, right? It is important to listen to people who are smarter than us, who have studied the Bible, who are so uh, experienced in their walk with the Lord. But here's the thing, these teachers don't know you exist. They don't know you exist. As wonderful as Spurgeon is, he's super dead, but he's alive in God, but he's dead, you know? These teachers and these podcasters, they don't look you in the eye and know your story. Again, as a a person who listens to podcasts and preachers, love it. So this is like sounding out from me. Um, These preachers and podcasters, they can't celebrate your triumphs or walk with you in suffering. They don't know your best days. They don't know your shadow self. They cannot bring loving correction to you and call you to walk alongside them when you're getting run over by the struggle bus. These people have not done life with you. So if I'm neglecting gathering with other believers because I'm like, well, I already, you know, I, I already tuned in online. <laughs> But if I'm neglecting and get the gathering of believers, if I'm not coming to the table of the family of God, then I am missing out on being fathered and mothered and encouraged as a sister 
in this beautiful privilege of being a part of the family of God. That intentional, eye-level walk with Jesus and with one another. And I know for some of us, maybe the topic of family is a very sore spot, that it's marked by deep, deep brokenness and abuse, emotional neglect, etc. But the gospel is this, the beauty of the gospel is this, that we are born into a new family where all those relational wounds are being carried by Christ himself to be healed. Matthew 12, in Matthew 12, Jesus says this, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples, points at us here in this room and says, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Christ himself said this about you, his disciples. It is in the family of God that we can be mothered and fathered into relational redemption again to the point where the blood of Jesus then transcends the blood of family. And isn't that true for some of us here? That some, for a lot of us, your church family is closer to you than your blood family. And that is actually the point. <laughs> Christ came here to redeem the family, and we can never grow out of our need to be parented in the faith. But there also then comes a time where some of us need to stop being kids. And as Paul says, put away childish things. How long have you been on the spiritual milk? Hebrews 5 kind of talks about this in verses 12 through 13. It says, you've been believers for so long. Now you ought to be teaching others. <laughs> Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know what to do what's right. And isn't this why you're here? To get your spiritual teeth and gut ready for the meat of the word. This is why we're here, to grow together, to be mothered and fathered, and for the spirit to mature us into eating solid food, eating spiritual solid food. And hey, this is no shame to you if you're still in the milk stage of being a believer. Welcome, praise the Lord, we're so glad you're here, and what a beautiful season it is for you to be held and comforted by the women around you, by the simple, God that's, the simple God, gospel that saved you. What a beautiful season it is to be parented by saints around you who have history with Jesus, to be surrounded by sisters who are also in the same spiritual maturity stage as you, also growing and walking with Jesus. And this is what Paul and his crew did to the Thessalonian believers in fathering and mothering these Thessalonians in a very present way for those three to six weeks. And it sounds like a really short time, right? <laughs> Sounds like not much time, it's like a semester maybe, or a hybrid class, but, but this just means that there was great depth to their relationship. There was great teaching and discipleship that was intentional, that was happening, to raise up these believers in the way that now their faith was known throughout the ancient world. What a beautiful testimony. And what was their goal? What does Paul say was their goal? In verse 12, it says that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Highlight that, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And as leaders in the study, here in Fresh Faith in this moment, we have that same goal for ourselves and for you. Because how many more weeks do we have in this study? How many more weeks? Oh, I, I'm bad at math. About six weeks. In that same amount of time, the Thessalonian believers were being spiritually parented, nursed, discipled, taught, exhorted, charged with the call of Jesus. And, and then Paul and his posse had to flee after that time because of persecution and stuff. But then months later, it was reported to them by Timothy that their testimony of spiritual tenacity was known throughout the ancient world. And considering how many more weeks do we have in this study, think about that. Could this also be true of us, ladies? It's not just a study that you come in and check in and whatever. Look at how much time the Thessalonians had with Paul and look at how much time we have together in the word of God, being taught by the spirit, learning from Jesus. Why could this also, why not us? Why not us as well? That could this be what God has for us as well in the weeks to come? And maybe you're here saying, Faith, I don't actually um, know how to be a part of a family. Maybe some of us here 
don't have a super great family. Maybe you're saying, Faith, I don't know how to act in a family setting. What if I end up bringing my own family brokenness into the family of God? What if I mess up the weeks because I brought, brought up my stuff? Well, my sisters, it's in the family of God where your familial and relational wounds can be healed. Christ has time for your brokenness. Christ has time. You're like, but I only have a couple weeks. Christ has time. God has time. And maybe you're, you're in another boat where you say, well, what if it was the family of God who hurt me? I can't invest in these weeks because I'm guarded. What if it was the church who actually hurt me? To that, to that I say, I'm so, so sorry. Because I've also been hurt by the church in the past as well. And I'm not going to stand here and say something insensitive like, oh, but it was people who hurt you, not God. It's like, you're like, duh. <laughs> Those of us who have been hurt by the church, we're like, we know, but people still hurt me, and it was terrible. And I'm not here to belittle your situation. But it's also something to note that it's in the church that, yes, we can be hurt. It is possible for us to be hurt. But you know what is certain? Healing every time, every time. In the church, we can be hurt, but we are certain to be healed. And here's the difference between getting hurt in the church and getting hurt outside of the church. Those who hurt you in the church are accountable to God. Those outside of the church are accountable to no one but themselves. Yeah, they're accountable to God at the judgment, but we also pray for their salvation, amen? But in the church, immediately, God sees you. God is wanting to protect you and that there is accountability And there is restoration available in the hand of God. And then for those of us who've been hurt by the church, God uses the family of faith, a healthy family of faith, to then help us practice and get back on our feet of what it means to love one another, to wash one another's feet, to have our feet be washed when we gather at the table of God. And it's at the table that we are actively being healed when we gather on Sundays with brothers and sisters, multi-generational, together, multicultural, at the table of God, we are in the midst of mothers in the faith, fathers in the faith, siblings in the faith, kids in the faith. If you don't have biological children, look at the church. You have spiritual children that you could pour into. At this table together, and at this table, we are passing the blood and the body of Jesus that was broken and hurt so that you may be healed, so that you may be made whole. And we're partaking of this healing together at the table as the family of God. And this is why family matters, my sisters. You're here because the Spirit has drawn you into this beautiful spiritual family, this spiritual adoption. And Jesus says himself, I will not leave you as orphans. I have sent the Spirit. And of the Spirit, Romans 8 says this, for all those who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified. And I also love that in the Old and New Testament, God is called the father to the fatherless, a covenant keeper to the widow, our our bridegroom, us as the bride. And I love this too. Christ calls us brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2.11 says this, for the one who sanctifies um, and those who are sanctified all have one father. And this is why, get this, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Christ calls us brothers and sisters. So you're like, cool, awesome, part of the family of God. I need to figure out what that looks like. What are my immediate marching orders, Faith? What do I do? Well, all the attributes of spiritual mothering and fathering that we talked about are all just attributes of Christ himself, Christ-likeness. So if I'm ever confused or lost on how to parent my kid or spiritually parent young people who look up to me, I look to Jesus. How does Jesus do this? If I'm ever confused on how to discipline or exhort or correct someone, I look to Jesus. 
learn from him. If I don't know how to be a good brother or sister in the faith, if I don't know how to be a good sibling in the faith, look to Jesus. Jesus. Because the goal, right, that Paul says is to walk worthy, to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So how do we walk in a manner that's worthy of God? Who walked in the manner worthy of God first? Jesus. So we need to walk in step with Jesus. And this threefold thing of walking with Jesus it looks like this, that we are to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus does. And that is what family matters is in the family of faith.